Since the earliest moments in recorded history, humankind has been fascinated by the nighttime sky, the vastness of space, and what wonders lie out there just waiting to be discovered. Though the futile dream of exploring this vast expanse has lived for thousands of years, it was not until the middle of the 20th century that the goal grew within reach. What was once weapons of mass destruction had instead become a method for traveling higher, farther, and faster than ever before possible. Delivering such incredible thrusts to break the bonds of Earth's gravity and send a man-made object into orbit, and perhaps even further. Over the next two decades, the technology of space exploration had increased exponentially. What started off as a simple goal of launching the first satellite had blossomed into the unthinkable task of landing a human being on the moon a quarter million miles from Earth and bringing him back alive. The sheer fantastic nature of this task, even decades after the fact, had remained so paramount that many had held on to the belief that the entire venture was an elaborate and expensive hoax. A big contributing factor to this baseless accusation is that the many missions leading to the landing, the advancements achieved, and the thousands upon thousands of people involved have been all but completely forgotten. Welcome to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space. It is my goal here to provide a complete account of humankind's journey into space, based on facts, figures, and information, all available in public domain. Through 2016, we will be giving the program a slightly different approach. Each week we will explore every prominent event that happened this week in space history, following each mission in detail. I will endeavor to prevent any boring lists of numbers and figures, but instead focus on the adventure itself as each mission and event was, in essence, an odyssey. This week, our program will take a more somber tone, as the three major spaceflight disasters that cost American lives had all occurred during this week. The fire of Apollo 1, the explosion of the Challenger, and the fiery breakup of the Columbia. Today, we will explore these events of all three missions, what the investigations uncovered, and the impact of the events from those who lived it. This program includes excerpts from Failure is Not an Option and Beyond the Moon on the History Channel and Moonshot on PBS. Radio Odyssey and Cymax Media claim no ownership or copyright of these materials. Some events in tonight's program may be graphic or disturbing in nature. Discretion is advised. The beginnings of manned spaceflight were some of the most technologically innovative years of world history, solving impossible problems daily, building for goals whose methods were still untested. This was especially true when North American Aviation received the contract for the Apollo Command Module, a mere three months after America put their first man in space, for a grand total of 15 minutes. Before America even had the capability to place a man into Earth orbit, development began on the vehicle that would one day take them all the way to the moon. And not just one person either. To that time, no nation on Earth had sent more than a single person into space, and Apollo was meant to carry three, as well as grant them room to move about the cabin. Though, moving is a relative term, as it's almost like saying one has room to move between boxes in a packed storage unit, but while in zero-g, standing upright is not a factor and far greater economy of space can be achieved without a defined floor and ceiling. This was also due to one of the craft's primary determining factors being weight. But no weight saving factor would be as crucial as a decision to restrict the spacecraft atmosphere to a 100% pure oxygen environment. For a craft to have an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere, as one would typically encounter on the ground, it would require separate oxygen and nitrogen tanks. Omitting one of the two gases presents a notable savings in weight, but presented a tremendous risk of fire hazard. To prevent this, the atmosphere was specified to be as low as possible for nominal breathing. In this case, the cabin pressurized to only 5 psi, or pounds per square inch, during flight. Early abort and landing tests of the spacecraft would begin shortly after Mercury's conclusion in 1963, while in the meantime, Mercury contractor McDonnell Aircraft would continue working with NASA through the Gemini program to test and develop many of the methods that Apollo would require to get to the moon. 
This gave Germany the benefit of McDonald's Mercury experience. Meanwhile, North America continued with its own developments, launching the first unmanned test in February 1966, halfway through Germany. A month after, NASA would announce the crew for the first manned Apollo flight. Commander Gus Grissom, America's second man in space, and the first man to fly twice. An incredible pilot and engineer who had flown two perfect missions, but unfortunately that is not what he is best remembered for. Since his first flight, he could not shake the label as the man who lost his ship. After the hatch blew unexpectedly, the Liberty Bell 7 spacecraft sank in the ocean. Was I, did I feel that I was in danger at any time during the flight or in the water? Well, I was scared a good portion of the time. I guess this is a pretty good indication. You were what? Scared. <laughs> okay. Of all the feelings an astronaut was not allowed to express, fear was the biggest. While anyone would certainly be scared in such a situation, the rumors began to fly that he had purposefully blown the hatch to escape. It hurt him very, very much. It's very easy to blame the astronaut, but that wasn't Gus. Gus was much too great an engineer and too serious a pilot. All of Grissom's colleagues knew this, of course, and trusted in his ability as an astronaut, regardless of what the public may think. And of all the astronauts in the program, NASA knew that Gus, with his engineering background and flight experience, would be the best man to truly evaluate the new spacecraft during its first flight. I'm real pleased to be on a first flight. Looking forward to it. just now starting getting into the uh, Apollo systems and looking at Apollo spacecraft and trying to forget everything I knew about Gemini. I think we've got a real good crew with Ed and Roger. Flying beside Grissom as senior pilot was Ed White, the first American to step outside the spacecraft and walk in space during the flight of Gemini 4. Arguably the best athlete in the program, and quite adept at the American hero role that John Glenn had adopted so easily. I had a great faith that the people and the equipment that we were using for the mission, I had a great faith in myself and especially in Jim, and also I think I had a great faith in my own God. I remember after his flight, he insisted on putting in his life personal contract story the question of how did you feel when you got out on the first spacewalk. And he told the life reporter, I felt red, white, and blue all over. And I went to Ed and I said, come on, Ed, we're all patriotic, but that's bullshit. He said, nope, that stays. Just like that. That's the way I felt. In the right-hand seat was Roger Chaffee set to make his first space flight. Chaffee had been distinguished years earlier by flying the reconnaissance mission that had taken photographs of the Soviet missiles in Cuba during the missile crisis. While many test pilots had become absorbed in their own egos, Chaffee was known for making a point of talking to even the most basic of employees and making them feel like they were some of the most important members of the program. He loved everything about spaceflight and wanted nothing more than to be part of the very first Apollo mission. But before anyone could go to the moon, they had to make sure that the craft could fly. This craft, however, was the most complicated piece of machinery ever devised. 30 miles of wire in the electrical system alone, and enough technology to run a nuclear submarine crammed into a vehicle that could fit into a home garage. Changes were made constantly, so often, in fact, that the training simulators couldn't keep up and were almost useless, as many procedures would no longer be valid. Worse, nearly everything that had been developed through Mercury and Gemini, and all the experience gained, was practically omitted through Apollo's development. The lack of useful training had become so frustrating for Grissom that he had finally hung a lemon on the training simulator to illustrate his dissatisfaction. In a more jovial gesture, the Apollo 1 crew had presented North American VP Harrison Storms and Joseph Shea, NASA program manager, with a special gift. A framed portrait of the three astronauts sitting at a table, praying to a model of the Apollo spacecraft. A caption written at the bottom reads, It's not that we don't trust you, but 
This time we've decided to go over your head. Meanwhile, NASA was in overdrive. Everyone acutely aware of the goal that late President Kennedy had set to reach the moon before the end of the decade. There were only three years left and at least four missions planned to be flown before the moon could be reached. We used to be working 16, 18 hours a day. You'd work six, seven days a week. You automatically worked every Saturday. That was the world we lived in. That's a go fever. It's other inputs that make you want to do things beyond the good logic you have. We suffered go fever many times because of that commitment to Mr. Kennedy. Work on the spacecraft was behind schedule as well. NASA can rush and rush all they like, but without a working vehicle, their hard work would amount to very little. NASA would make several inquiries and even demands to North American to get their work completed, and time was certainly not on their side. As several proposed launch dates slipped by, North American finally shipped the Block 1 Command Service Module to NASA. The spacecraft had been delivered, but of course we had lived with it for you know, many, many months before at the uh, contractor's plant, uh, North American Rockwell. And we knew that the spacecraft was, you know, in poor shape relative to what it ought to be. We felt like we could fly it, but let's face it, it just wasn't as good as uh, it should have been for the job of flying the first manned Apollo mission. We were dealing with new contractors who had their own ideas on how they were going to do things. All of the history of Mercury and Gemini was put aside, and the knowledge of the people that got us that far was also put aside. You don't throw your history away, you learn from it, and that's why I called it Project Appalling. Despite being delivered, the craft still had a lot of work needing to be done. Several systems untested, several components uninstalled, several procedures left open. Wally Shira, commander of the backup crew, recalls his frustration over the craft and its condition. Got to the Cape, still had a whole bunch of open items. Start build, rebuilding the spacecraft practically there. It was rather discouraging. So we had a test where my crew, the backup crew, would run through all the procedures, switch work, checkouts, countdown, in shirt sleeves with a normal atmosphere environment where in turn Grissom and his crew would do it the next day in the pure oxygen environment in their suits. Well, the night before debriefing what I had done privately with Gus and Joe Shea, who was our project manager, I said, Gus, there's things I, I, I just don't feel comfortable with. There, there's some anomalies that aren't working out right. And if something goes wrong and you don't like it, get the hell out of there. Hell, he wasn't going to do that. That would have brought the program to a stop, and everybody said, well, that's chicken shit guy, and all that kind of stuff. You've got a cast of thousands geared up to perform a test, and you're critical to that test, and here you are, you've worked all day long, and you're down to the last half hour, last hour. It's very difficult to just say, hey, I'm putting everything to a stop here. This test was called the plugs out test. All umbilical connections to the spacecraft removed, and all systems tested under their own power. In addition to that, a second test was conducted simultaneously, a stress test of the hull with a pressurized atmosphere to check for any leaks or weaknesses. This is done by pressurizing the cabin to a comparable level to simulate the positive pressure of spaceflight. While in space, the cabin is meant to contain 5 psi, the test is conducted at sea level, where the external pressure is already 14.8. This therefore requires an internal pressure of almost 17 psi of pure oxygen. We were going very fast. NASA was behind schedule as always. And we were running tests without taking time to really look at the data. The entire staff was in overdrive, from the top of the ladder all the way to the bottom working constant overtime, pushing through exhaustion and stress, fighting the clock every step of the way. Something had to give. It is now January 27, 1967, the final major test to ready the spacecraft for its flight a month later. Grissom, White, and Chaffee are all sealed into the command module, wearing full pressure suits, sealed behind the three-layer hatch, 
Everyone pushes to get this final test completed and take a deep breath for the weekend. But this was no ordinary test. It's not a normal workday. You know, you stayed there till the test was done, which meant that you might be in that spacecraft 18, 20 hours. It was a long, arduous test. The sun sets in Florida as the test drags on into the evening. But much like the simulators, the craft itself was beginning to frustrate both the crew and flight controllers. We had some communication problems. We were having trouble. We were testing out the various uh, loops and, and radios. I remember that day we just couldn't talk with the crew. The communication was just terrible. We're literally behind in every area of our work. And nobody stood up and said, stop. At approximately 6.30 p.m., a short circuit in a bundle of wires under Grissom's seat had caused a spark to jump out. Normally, a spark fizzles out after a few seconds, but in a pure oxygen environment, it only intensifies, glowing brighter and brighter. 6.31 and six seconds. Okay, we didn't copy anybody. Anything fire? I thought to myself, this could be really serious because the first thing that came into my mind was 100% oxygen. Fire was the last thing you ever wanted to hear if you're operating with oxygen. And they couldn't get out, they were trapped. Fire sweeps through the craft, doubling the internal pressure in a matter of seconds, finally bursting through the hull. And that was the end of it. It was all over in about 12 seconds. The pressure suits were designed to protect them, but the suit hoses that feed breathing oxygen had melted through. Toxic fumes from the smoke seep through and all three men suffocate. The ruptured hull had bled out internal pressure, the external air rushing in, essentially quenching the fire. But thick smoke continued to bellow out. It would take five minutes for the ground crews to remove all three hatches and look inside. Grissom and White had left their seats, all three in positions that indicated normal emergency procedures. Grissom attempting to reach for the purge valve, White attempting to remove the hatch, and Chaffee remaining in his seat to maintain communication until the hatch was removed, all performing their duty right up to the very end. For many of the young flight controllers at NASA, this was their first experience with death, many of whom could only watch helplessly in agonizing hours it took to retrieve the crew lost in agonizing reflection, self-loathing, or simply breaking down in sorrow. NASA begins an immediate investigation, requesting to President Lyndon Johnson that NASA be allowed to conduct the investigation themselves, with the promise to be truthful in assessing blame. NASA Administrator James Webb pledging to assign it to himself and NASA management as appropriate. All Apollo 1 hardware and software was immediately impounded to be released only under the control of the Apollo 204 Review Board. This board would be chaired by Floyd L. Thompson, director of the Langley Research Center, and include eight executive members, including astronaut Frank Borman, who was tasked with the disassembly of the spacecraft. Oversight committees in both houses of Congress were questioning this decision feeling that it would be a total whitewash, but elected to allow NASA to continue its investigation, after which would convene a special hearing, chaired by Senator Clinton P. Anderson, scheduled for a month later. Three days after the accident, Flight Director Gene Kranz calls a meeting with the mission control team, during which he gives a speech that would subsequently become the founding principles of the continuation of NASA, a speech that he can still recite to this day. Spaceflight's terribly unforgiving of carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. 
I don't know what the Thompson Committee will find as the cause of this accident, but I know what I find. We were the cause. The simulators weren't ready. Our software and mission control didn't function. Procedures weren't complete. Nothing we did had any shelf life. And no one stood up and said, damn it, stop. Now, from this day forward, mission control will be known by two words, tough and competent. Tough meaning we will never again shirk from our responsibility because we're forever accountable for what we do or what we fail to do. Competent will never again take anything for granted. We'll never stop learning. When you leave here today, you will write these two words, tough and competent, on your blackboard, and they will never be erased. They will serve as a constant reminder to the sacrifice of Grissom, White, and Shaffy. That's all. And then I remember walking out of there and people starting to gather in little groups and starting to talk. And I think our whole attitude changed and I think we changed. I think we then took the challenge to go make things right. I think the American public is mature enough to recognize that it's an important program and it's a program that must go on. And if something should happen, why, well, it happened. We still have to go on living every day and we go on and uh, continue the program. I remember that Max Fugier and Deke Slayton and I, we were at the Cape for the investigation. We went out one night and got bombed. Uh, I'm not proud to say I don't drink anymore, but we got bombed that night. Ended up throwing glasses like a, like a scene out of an old World War I movie. But then the next day, that was it. It was now back to work on a new and painful job. NASA had given absolute cooperation with the Congressional Committee and over the next month went through every inch of the spacecraft. North American had even offered one of its other completed Block 1 spacecraft as a template for Apollo 1's disassembly. And what they found was haunting and disturbing. We had crap in that spacecraft that wouldn't quit. It had a big sponge foam pad, highly combustible. We had Velcro in it. The thing was wallpapered with Velcro with an adhesive that was highly flammable and toxic. Everything was wrong. Everything was wrong. We put 100% oxygen into that vehicle and then pressurized it. Now, we'd done that all through Gemini, all through Mercury, and we were doing that in Apollo. And nobody stood up and said, hey, you guys know what you got when you pressurize 100% oxygen? You, you got a bomb sitting there. The investigation turned to the ignition source originating amongst miles and miles of wire. Based on best estimates that the investigative team could make, it had appeared that after a panel door had been opened and closed a few times, two sections of insulation along the wire had worn off, exposing the wire. When a current traveled through the wire, there was an open arc between the two spots that had created the spark. As the spark was intensified in the pure oxygen environment, it would ignite the nylon netting under Grissom's seat. Once the fire had started to expand, there was no stopping it. Total combustion was inevitable. In his monograph, Project Apollo, The Tough Decisions, NASA Deputy Administrator Robert Siemens wrote that the single biggest mistake in engineering judgment was to not run a fire test in the command module prior to the plugs out test. The biggest irony in the entire accident was the hatch. Even before the fire, the high-pressure oxygen environment made it impossible to open the inward opening hatch. During design stages, North American had originally suggested an outward opening hatch, with explosive bolts that could blow the hatch quickly in the case of emergency. NASA did not agree, citing the example of Grissom's Liberty Bell 7 flight, in which the hatch had blown accidentally and caused the spacecraft to sink. The very thing that was implemented to prevent disaster after Grissom's earlier flight was what ended up costing him his life six years later. The Thompson Committee's findings 
were provided during the hearings before Congress on February 27th. While Committee Chairman Anderson remained neutral, Senator Walter Mondale was far more aggressive in placing blame against both NASA and Apollo contractor North American Aviation. At one point, he asked Webb if he knew of a Phillips report criticizing North American for serious inadequacies in quality control. Though Webb did not know of any such report, Siemens knew of a memo given to North American President John Lee Atwood two years earlier, and had feared that Mondale had a copy of the memo in his hand. The memo was not originally offered to Congress due to the fact that it was classified information, yet Mondale had apparently taken the unusual step of admitting it as evidence regardless. NASA was left with no choice but to declassify this report, and it became clear throughout that the aggressive schedule and constantly changing engineering requirements caused many mistakes to be made and several instances of oversight. It was likely President Johnson's support that allowed the threat to Apollo to blow over, as he had been a staunch supporter of NASA since its inception and had influence over Congress from his own senatorial experience, as well as his skill at portraying the Apollo program as part of late President Kennedy's legacy. Despite this, many employees were removed from their duties, including Harrison Storms, chief designer at North American, and Apollo program manager Joseph Shea. Jules Bergman of ABC News had conducted an interview with the three men of Apollo 1 before the flight. After the disaster, he replayed those events in remembrance of the three fallen astronaut heroes. Gus Grissom spoke with me earlier about his own philosophy on what risks he took while being an astronaut. Oh, I doubt if I have any philosophy towards the danger. I, I recognize that there is some risk, but uh, uh, we just try to take as much of that out, of, out as we can during the pre-testing to make sure the systems are good. We recognize that there are unknowns and things can happen that, that we haven't planned for, but uh, I try to take care of this by, by leaving an open mind and, and trying not to let the fellows get stereotyped in how function procedures and the way we do things. And, at least try to make sure that they don't do anything impulsively. If we get a noise or something happens, we take a check, take time to see what we're doing and make sure that every time they move a switch or push a button, that they look and they have the right one, you know. There's none of this blind, blind fool cockpit business. Gus Grissom knew what the problems are, knew what the risks are, and also knew the haunting failures <clears throat> that can accompany a space flight. His Liberty Bell 7 from his Mercury Redstone flight back in 1961 had sunk in an accident that has never, never quite adequately been explained and Gus had always felt badly about losing that spacecraft. The senior pilot, or SP as he's called, aboard uh, the Apollo spacecraft, Lieutenant Colonel Ed White, 36 years old. In June of 1965, he made history when he became our first man to walk in space. It came just three months after Russia's Alexei Leonov had become the world's first spacewalker aboard Voshkod 1. His 20 minutes outside the spacecraft brought us up to par in the space race. He doubled the EVA time set by Russia's Lanov. Back in those early days of Gemini, a much simpler vehicle than Apollo. If any of our astronauts have ever been worried, they've never said so for the record. Still, those of us who cover the space story keep asking them about the dangers and Ed White recently answered me this way. Well, I always look forward to uh, flying, and I look forward to test flying. I haven't been in combat, so I can't say that. And in the same manner, I look forward to the, my flight in Gemini 4, and I'm really looking forward to this flight in Apollo. I think that the, the difference people might look at our work as, as uh, being perhaps dangerous or risky of sorts, but I think we train in it and work in it so much that, and understand it well enough that we don't look at it from this viewpoint. No at least I don't. I'm speaking for myself. You're aware of the risks. And we accept the risks, if there are, what risks there are, and the people we work with uh, do everything that's humanly possible to reduce these risks to as small as possible. And you believe in them? I believe in, uh, I believe very deeply in the people we work with and the crew. I certainly do. Ed White, who understood the risks too, and was a marvelous human being in his own way. Despite the risks, which they all knew only too well, there were and are certain advantages to being an astronaut. 
Roger Chaffee explained to me what he wanted to gain out of his spaceflight training and experience. I asked if there were any advantages to being a young new astronaut. Well, I don't know if it gives you any special advantages. Uh, I think NASA policy is, uh, well, I really hate to say what NASA policy is, but I think I could be around to fly for quite a few more years yet. And as to how far I want to go, I want to go as far as uh, NASA goes in, during my useful time as a pilot to them. Uh, I'd like to go on a moon flight, and if we go to Mars, I'd like to go on that. These three men will always be remembered. Their names etched permanently upon a monument that sits on the surface of the moon, placed there by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, whom had felt that it was this selfless sacrifice of Grissom, White, and Chaffee that had given NASA the focus it needed to make the landing possible. If ever there was a vehicle that could match or even exceed the complexity of the Apollo Command module, it would have to be the very symbol of NASA for an entire generation, the Space Shuttle. A vehicle that had performed almost flawlessly since its very first flight in 1981, completing 24 missions over the span of five years. As marvelous a creation for spaceflight that the shuttle was, its very success could be one of the worst things that had happened to it. When you start becoming comfortable with a craft, you inevitably become complacent. Former flight controller Jerry Griffin explains. I always felt in the shuttle that we had arrived kind of where commercial aviation arrived, uh, that, that there would, it was now time that we were going to put a pilot in the front that didn't have a parachute and passengers in the back that didn't have a parachute. And uh, you, you're going to trust the system to work. Indeed, the system did work all too well. So well, in fact, that lingering problems and concerns had been put aside, and a comfortable easiness over those who operate and maintain the craft, that it would always do what it was designed to do. So, what happens when it encounters things that it wasn't designed for? It is now 1986. The second orbiter to join the shuttle fleet, the Challenger, is set to deliver several satellites into orbit including an experiment to observe Halley's Comet. Its mission, STS-51L, was special in another way. It was the inaugural mission in NASA's Teacher in Space program, a program intended to inspire students and spark greater interest in math, science, engineering, and space exploration. Of over 11,000 applicants, the final decision would come down to a high school social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, named Krista McAuliffe. It was the intention for her to teach several lessons from the shuttle, and upon her return to Earth, share her experience in space with her students. Ironically, despite the promotion of this program, the public attention toward NASA had not improved very much. Spaceflight had been considered routine, much like commercial aviation had, and people moved on with what they considered to be more interesting or important things. Despite this, NASA still had a mission to accomplish, and McAuliffe was determined and eager to show her students what a wonderful experience it could be. The launch date had been rescheduled and delayed several times over a week-long period, and it was now January 28, 1986. The weather was unseasonably cold. On final launch day, it had reached as low as 26 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 3 degrees Celsius. Numerous components of the solid rocket boosters were certified only for use above 40 degrees. These boosters, once ignited, could not be shut down. Once they ignite, the shuttle is committed to flight, and for two minutes, they could not be separated. This was the seventh launch attempt, and if this one was canceled, it would not get another launch window until April, and the Halley's Comet observation would have to be abandoned. At 11.38 a.m., engines ignited and Challenger left the pad. We launched. Everything looked good. Good roll, Floyd. Raj, good roll. Mentally now, my clock is running. 
because after two minutes, the mission control team and the astronauts start to have escaped options. But prior to that time, there is no escape. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. We got to the, the throttle down, throttle up call. We'll throttle down to uh, 65%. And I was now seconds away from feeling this, this burden being released from you. You're at 65. 65, Fido. TDL confirms throttle, thank you. Still looking good, engines came up. The Capcom responded, you're go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. It was a TV about right over there. And we've been trained, watch the data, don't watch the TV. I saw just a flicker of light. And I glanced over there momentarily. And it was horror. Go ahead. Flight GC, we've had uh, negative contact, lost the downlink. Copy. OK, all operators, watch your data carefully. And I look over, just see their faces. And then I looked over there at the TV, and, and there was the, the smoke column y'all have seen as much as we have. I looked at Jay, and this, the, the look on his face, was something that you see only a few times in your life. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. Flight Fado, go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. Fido, can we get any reports from recovery forces? Stand by. Dismay, horror, uh, pain. Uh, just wonder if you could do something, could have done something to have forestalled it. And this uh, horror, you know, grips you. It, it uh, becomes almost unimaginable and your ability to live with it, but that is our job, to live with the risk of our business, and some days it's bad. This is the nature of people who hold lives in their hands. As recovery forces scour the ocean downrange to recover debris, NASA immediately pours through all data, instrumentation, and video footage from the pad looking for any warning signs or clues as to the cause of the accident. While onboard telemetry showed everything as normal, the video footage immediately showed the cause, and indeed, it all originated with the solid rocket boosters. As the boosters ignited, a puff of smoke could be seen on the right booster, along the joint of the booster connected to the external fuel tank. This joint of the booster is sealed by a pair of rubber O-rings, both of which have become brittle by the cold and failed to maintain their seal. This puff of smoke was all that the joint had emitted at the time, and the seal could have still been maintained for the two minutes until separation. But 37 seconds into the flight, for a 27 second period, telemetry had recorded several wind shear events far stronger than any previous flights. The little bit of integrity that the oxide seal had maintained was lost at this point. 60 seconds into ascent, what was once a puff of smoke would instead become a plume of flame escaping through the side of the booster, burning almost like a blowtorch who had reached the skin of the external fuel tank. 64 seconds into flight, liquid hydrogen began to leak from the tank and combust, throwing off the center of thrust and causing the shuttle's main engines to pivot automatically in the attempt to compensate for the deviation. The strut at the bottom of the booster had buckled until finally breaking free at 72 seconds, now connected only at the nose as the back of the booster pulled away, 
causing the vehicle to lurch slightly to the right. One second later, the back of the external tank had ruptured completely, the force of its combustion causing the hydrogen tank in the back to ram into the liquid oxygen tank in the front, causing a rupture in both tanks. At the same time, the continued sideways motion of the separated booster had caused the nose, still only attached by the forward strut, to impact the side of the tank. Complete structural failure resulted at 73.1 seconds, the external tank erupting in flames, smoke, and debris. Challenger, strapped helplessly to the failing tank, tumbled through the air, and with the force of the tank explosion and the air rushing over the vehicle faster than the speed of sound, the entire spacecraft broke into pieces, already obscured by the expanding cloud of smoke caused by the tank rupture. The nose of the spacecraft, including the crew cabin and a portion of the payload bay, had emerged from the explosion, along with several structural surfaces and the craft wings. At this point, the vehicle was 48,000 feet in altitude, approximately 15 kilometers, and still traveling upward. The cabin would reach a final altitude of 65,000 feet, 20 kilometers in altitude, 30 seconds later, over twice as high as the tallest peak of Mount Everest. Telemetry later reported that four of the crew members had activated their personal egress air packs after the breakup, indicating that the crew had survived. Whether or not the crew was conscious afterward is still unknown, and depended entirely upon whether or not the cabin had maintained pressure integrity. If it did not, the crew could not have maintained consciousness at that altitude, as the oxygen packs only provided air, not pressure. However, if it did, the crew may have been conscious until they hit the water, as the cabin was not equipped with parachutes. A separatable crew cabin was proposed during the shuttle's early development, but as this would have required an isolated oxygen and power supply, separate from the shuttle's main body, as well as a method for cleanly separating the connections, it was determined to add too much weight and complexity. All seven members of mission STS-51L were dead. During a memorial service for the Challenger crew, President Ronald Reagan had personally performed the eulogy for the families, friends, and loved ones of the fallen crew. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans, to share the grief that we all feel, and perhaps in that sharing to find the strength to bear our sorrow and the courage to look for the seeds of hope. Our nation's loss is first a profound personal loss to the family, and the friends, and the loved ones of our shuttle astronauts. To those they left behind, the mothers, the fathers, the husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, yes, and especially the children. All of America stands beside you in your time of sorrow. What we say today is only an inadequate expression of what we carry in our hearts. Words pale in the shadow of grief. They seem insufficient even to measure the brave sacrifice of those you loved and we so admired. Their truest testimony will not be in the words we speak, but in the way they led their lives and in the way they lost their lives. With dedication, honor, and an unquenchable desire to explore this mysterious and beautiful universe. The best we can do is remember our seven astronauts, our Challenger 7. Remember them as they lived, bringing life and love and joy to those who knew them and pride to a nation. They came from all parts of this great country, from South Carolina to Washington State, Ohio to Mohawk, New York, Hawaii to North Carolina to Concord, New Hampshire. They were so different, yet in their mission, their quest, they held so much in common. We remember Dick Scobie, the commander who spoke the last words we heard from the Space Shuttle Challenger. 
He served as a fighter pilot in Vietnam, earning many medals for bravery, and later as a test pilot of advanced aircraft before joining the space program. Danger was a familiar companion to Commander Scobie. We remember Michael Smith, who earned enough medals as a combat pilot to cover his chest, including the Navy Distinguished Flying Cross, three air medals, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with Silver Star, in gratitude from a nation he fought to keep free. We remember Judith Resnick, known as J.R. to her friends, always smiling, always eager to make a contribution, finding beauty in the music she played on her piano in her off hours. We remember Ellison Onizuka, who was a child running barefoot through the coffee fields and macadamia groves of Hawaii, dreamed of someday traveling to the moon. Being an Eagle Scout, he said, had helped him soar to the impressive achievements of his career. We remember Ronald McNair, who said that he learned perseverance in the cotton fields of South Carolina. His dream was to live aboard the space station, performing experiments and playing his saxophone in the weightlessness of space. Well, Ron, we will miss your saxophone, and we will build your space station. We remember Gregory Jarvis on that ill-fated flight he was carrying with him a flag of his university in Buffalo, New York. A small token, he said, to the people who unlocked his future. We remember Krista McAuliffe, who captured the imagination of the entire nation, inspiring us with her pluck, her restless spirit of discovery, a teacher not just to her students, but to an entire people instilling us all with the excitement of this journey we ride into the future. We will always remember them, these skilled professionals, scientists and adventurers, these artists and teachers and family men and women, and we will cherish each of their stories. Stories of triumph and bravery, stories of true American heroes. On the day of the disaster, our nation held a vigil by our television sets. In one cruel moment, our exhilaration turned to horror. We waited and watched and tried to make sense of what we had seen. That night, I listened to a call-in program on the radio. People of every age spoke of their sadness and the pride they felt in our astronauts. Across America, we are reaching out, holding hands, and finding comfort in one another. The sacrifice of your loved ones has stirred the soul of our nation. And through the pain, our hearts have been opened to a profound truth. The future is not free. The story of all human progress is one of a struggle against all odds. We learned again that this America which Abraham Lincoln called the last best hope of man on earth, was built on heroism and noble sacrifice. It was built by men and women like our seven star voyagers, who answered a call beyond duty, who gave more than was expected or required, and who gave it little thought of worldly reward. We think back to the pioneers of an earlier century, the sturdy souls who took their families and their belongings and set out into the frontier of the American West. Often they met with terrible hardship. Along the Oregon Trail, you can still see the grave markers of those who fell on the way. But grief only steeled them to the journey ahead. Today, the frontier is space and the boundaries of human knowledge. Sometimes when we reach for the stars, we fall short but we must pick ourselves up again and press on, despite the pain. Our nation is indeed fortunate that we can still draw on immense reservoirs of courage, character, and fortitude, that we're still blessed with heroes like those of the Space Shuttle Challenger. 
Dick Scobie knew that every launching of a space shuttle is a technological miracle. And he said, if something ever does go wrong, I hope that doesn't mean the end to the space shuttle program. Every family member I talked to asked specifically that we continue the program, that that is what their departed loved one would want above all else. We will not disappoint them. Today we promise Dick Scobie and his crew that their dream lives on, that the future they worked so hard to build will become reality. The dedicated men and women of NASA have lost seven members of their family. Still, they too must forge ahead with a space program that is effective, safe, and efficient, but bold and committed. Man will continue his conquest of space to reach out for new goals and ever greater achievements. That is the way we shall commemorate our seven Challenger heroes. Dick, Mike, Judy, Elle, Ron, Greg, and Krista, your families and your country mourn your passing. We bid you goodbye. We will never forget you. All shuttle flights are grounded indefinitely, while a commission was formed to conduct the investigation. It would be nearly three years before the space shuttle would fly again, but NASA was determined to make it so. While some aspects of upper management had their own feelings, the men and women of mission control and throughout spaceflight operations felt it was their duty to continue and not give up on the future. I think we all recognized the importance of recovering from that accident, resolving the problems, and moving on. There's a great deal of courage in the people here in this program. We don't do this because of the laurels from the public which have faded since the Apollo days. Uh, we do this because of a belief in what we do. This is the process of adventurers. This is the process of exploration. This is the process of people who are willing to accept risk we felt it essential to provide the inspiration for the students in our colleges and universities to develop the technologies we needed for the future. We felt it essential to our nation to remain explorers. Strict guidelines were added to keep the solid rocket boosters within their allowable margins. NASA was also urged to return to developing expendable rockets to lift commercial satellites into orbit, instead of having them rely exclusively on the shuttle. And for every subsequent launch, all aspects of the flight were covered by multiple cameras to analyze every frame of ascent. It was in this footage that something interesting had been uncovered. In nearly every space shuttle launch, chunks of foam insulation would break off the external fuel tank, and occasionally, these pieces of foam debris would strike the orbiter. This happened quite frequently, in fact. Some NASA officials are on record as stating that thousands of foam strikes have been detected impacting the orbiter, and only two times was a structural repair necessary. Both of these times the shuttle had performed perfectly throughout re-entry. It is now 2003. Over the last few years, the space shuttle have been almost entirely devoted to construction of the International Space Station. However, in this instance, a special science mission was scheduled, carrying a new SpaceHab double research module on board America's first operational shuttle, the Columbia. Mission STS-107 with a crew of seven. Cameras tracked Columbia as she made her ascent, covering every possible angle. Nothing had appeared out of the ordinary, Columbia reached orbit without incident. All camera footage was re-examined multiple times with the same judgment. It was not until the following day that higher resolution film, which had to be processed overnight, had revealed something questionable. 82 seconds into the flight, a chunk of foam insulation about the size of a briefcase broke free of the external tank and struck Columbia in the left wing disappearing in a puff of fine debris almost looking like smoke. The foam in this case had shed from the bipod ramp, 
which had been seen on four previous flights. In one case, it had struck the orbiter, creating a small dent, which did not compromise structural integrity. NASA management did not feel any justifiable reason to assume the foam strike had caused any significant damage to Columbia, only a minor annoyance for ground crews upon its return. Columbia therefore remained in orbit for its 15-day mission, the crew unaware of any concerns, as there were no operational procedures for a structural repair in space, nor any way to safely rescue the crew, as the shuttle was not in proper orbit to rendezvous with the International Space Station with the fuel they had. February 1st, 2003. Columbia performs its retrofire maneuver and makes its way into the atmosphere. On board Columbia, one of the crew members turned on a personal video camera and picks up chatter between the astronauts. Some marveling at the spectacle out the windows, and even the experienced crew members just as giddy through the wonders of spaceflight and the roller coaster ride of re-entry. Mission Commander Rick Husband takes Columbia through her sharp turns using the flat bottom of Columbia to provide aerobraking and spill off excess speed, as every shuttle would do through its lifespan. Unlike missions of the past, communication is relayed through satellites, so the shuttle is not shrouded in radio blackout, and mission control could stay in contact with the crew while flight controllers can keep track of telemetry. It was a very typical entry sort of day, until we started losing some sensors and uh, we lost uh, one which got our attention and within seconds a second one and then two more. Flight Max. Go ahead Max. FYI I've just lost four separate uh, temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle uh, hydraulic return temperatures. It was not anything to be concerned with because we've had sensors go off before. Copy. Looked to be an instrumentation problem quite frankly. Four hide return temps. Okay, is there anything common to them? Part of my responsibility are these sensors underneath the tile on the skin of the vehicle. And as I pulled up that display, I noticed that four of the two of the temperatures were off scale low, which um, is sort of an unpowered state. Jeff reported some more instrumentation that he had lost. I looked back at the display, and I had two more parameters going off scale low. I thought, well, this is unusual. And flight ecom. Become. I've got four temperature sensors on the bottom line data that are off scale low. We just couldn't come up with any single point failure that would explain all of the indications that we were seeing. Okay. There is no commonality. No commonality. Something's going on that we don't understand. I was standing over here, came over next to Ron, and Ralph was sitting in that chair, and I said, Ralph, that's the left wing. And that was the wing that the foam hit. Where is that instrumentation located? All in four the... of them are located in the uh, aft part of the left wing. I began to think about the fact that this was all happening in the left wing, and the fact that that we had a debris strike, and, and probably at that point is when I began to worry about the possibility of having hot gas in the wing. Houston, com check. Columbia, Houston, UHF, com check. I didn't go, I didn't expect uh, this bad of a hit on com. Final one, you expecting tracking? One minute to go, flight. One of our colleagues from our office had called in and said they saw multiple, uh, multiple objects in the path of where Columbia should have been. GC flight. GC flight. Fly GC. Lock the doors. Copy. There's a lot of symbolic meaning to that GC lock the door. And when he made the call, he did it twice very quickly, GC flight, GC flight, lock the doors. You know, part of me was, was wanting to transition into this sort of this angry mode of, you know, by golly, we're going to find out what happened, no matter what it takes. 
There's a whole list of data collection items that we need to make sure we log through. A massive recovery effort stretches across the state of Texas, searching for any debris that can be recovered. Meanwhile, further investigative attention focuses squarely on the foam strike. Many impact tests were conducted, utilizing stock paneling and reconstructed mock-ups. A piece of comparable foam insulation was fired at the mock-ups with an air gun to simulate the speed in which the foam strike had theoretically occurred. Each impact only left dents or small cracks in the paneling, not serious enough to cause Columbia's breakup. Then analysis was completed on the telemetry recorded from a flight data recorder, which was still a part of Columbia from its early initial tests in 1981. This data had helped narrow down exactly where the impact had occurred. Using this data, one final impact test was conducted, firing the foam block at panel 8, punching right through, and leaving a hole 16 inches wide, just over 40 centimeters. Such a breach would certainly be devastating for a returning orbiter. Indeed, as Columbia encountered the atmosphere, hot gases seeped through this hole, resulting in the lost instrumentation. This also compromised the vehicle's flight profile, throwing off its trajectory slightly. Crew members inside the cabin could be heard remarking that the attitude control thrusters were firing more than they should. This was the result of automatic control systems desperately trying to correct the deviation. Reentry plasma continued to seep through, filling the wing structure and tearing apart instruments and structural supports until the wing finally tore off completely. When this happened, Columbia began to barrel out of control, losing its heat shield orientation and coming apart violently. Even in the most ambitious contingency proposals during the shuttle's development, there was no way to survive this kind of breakup. Rick Husband, William McCool, David Brown, Kalpana Chawla, Michael Anderson, Laurel Clark and Island Ramon all perish, and the world's oldest operational spacecraft is never seen again. The shuttle program is grounded once again, as NASA works to prevent any further foam shedding from the external tank. Also, from this point on, every single shuttle will rendezvous with the International Space Station and perform a slow backflip maneuver allowing station crew to inspect the skin of the orbiter to check for any damages. No more human lives would be claimed in NASA spaceflight. In hindsight, all of these disasters could have been avoided, but that is hindsight talking. Every single one are products of the situation, and as much as people may claim to be the voice of opposition that could have saved the crew, none of these incidents were anyone's fault specifically and not a single astronaut who lost their lives in the conquest of space would want the program to end because of their deaths, every one of them knowing the risks and acknowledging them, in order to forge ahead in the great adventure of manned spaceflight. Some may even say that without these horrific events, the program might not have progressed as far as it did, as it was these shocking events that often gave NASA the kick in the rear end that it needed in order to finally succeed. The continuation of spaceflight is essential. I think Gene Cran says it best. I wish that as a nation uh, that we could set our sights much higher. I believe it is essential to have a national purpose. It is essential to maintain the pioneering spirit that made this country great. It's the spirit that got us through uh, this past century. It got us through world wars. It allowed us to move into a leadership role and it was a compassionate leadership role uh, throughout the world. It is a nation that allowed us to step up to the challenge of the Cold War and win it. It's a challenge that took the country to the moon. It took us into space. It made us the preeminent force in space. And in the process of doing this, we rekindled the pioneering spirit of a generation of people that grew up in the Depression and came to adulthood in the 60s and carried space from the 60s through to the early 90s. 
I would like to find some way to sufficiently challenge a new generation of people, to get them out of the I mode into the we mode, to make them want to do something rather than be something. I would like to give young people the same dream that we had. I would like to find our nation unified, the world unified, in the achievement of a common goal. I believe that space provides us. I believe difficult programs like Mars would provide it. But unfortunately, we do not have the national leadership that we need. We do not have a United States Congress that really recognize the need for this country to continue to grow and invest in R&D. We don't have the national leaders capable of stepping up and taking a difficult position and articulating why we must do something. I'm not interested in something for Gene Kranz. I'm interested in something for my children. I'm interested for something for my children's children because we are the only nation in the entire earth that is blessed with the types of freedom that we've had that has the economic potential of a great nation composed of so many different ethnic groups and types of people that are capable of doing these kinds of things. So we must continue to force leadership to grow. And I was privileged and proud to be part of the years when leadership flourished in this mission control. There's not one flight director who ever left here who was not inspired to do something else and to do better. And I think that it is important for us to communicate, not only to people here at Johnson, people who are going to be looking at these tapes, but to people of the nation, this very magnificent era that we all lived in, and maybe didn't look closely enough and find its true meaning. When we return, we explore our thoughts on these events, and later delve into recent advancements in science and technology. You are listening to Radio Odyssey 50 Years of Space on CIMAX Radio, the sci-fi voice of the universe. <laughs> 